Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, role of illustration in picture books and essential Leo storytelling with Kaba winners. And we are so delighted to have our Kaba winners, Adrian Wright and Elizabeth Zunin with us today. Uh, hosting for us is Dr. Helen Boyd, who is a associate Bond, who is associate professor in the School of Education at Howard University. She's a member of the board of the Center for African Studies. And Dr. Bond collaborates with us on many, many projects. Uh, we are so delighted to have her here as host. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Bond. Thank you, Brenda. I'm happy to be here and welcome audience. I'll be introducing our two speakers for today. And I'll start out with Adrian Wright. Please note that we will take Q&A after both speakers have spoken about 210. So please hold your questions or please send them through the chat if you would. Adrian Wright grew up in South America and studied graphic design and illustration at Art College in Johannesburg. Working in advertising agencies in South Africa and the United States as a graphic designer and art director led to her interest in illustration. She is a member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, where she served as the illustrator coordinator for the Eastern Pennsylvania chapter for many years. She won the Work of Outstanding Progress Award from SCBWI for the manuscript that became the debut book, Hector, A Boy, A Protest, and the Photograph That Changed Apartheid, published by Page Street Kids. Hector has received numerous excellent reviews and acknowledgments among them are starred reviews from Kirkus Reviews and ALA's Booklist 2020. Notable children's book, Kirkus Reviews Best of 2019, Middle Grade Biographies and Memoirs. 2019, Children Junior Library Guild Gold Standard Selection, Bank Street College 2020, List of the Best Children's Books of the Year and is also included on the Center for the Study of Multicultural Children's Literature Best Books of 2019 list. Hector received the 2020 Children Africana's Book Award for Best Book for Young Children. Adrian, welcome, lives in Gulf Mills, Pennsylvania. And next, Elizabeth Zunon was born in Albany, New York and grew up in the Ivory Coast of West Africa. As a little girl, she loved to draw, paint, and make up dances and play dress up in a household that was never devoid of chocolate. As she grew up, she didn't realize she didn't really change. Elizabeth now lives in Albany, where she explores a multicultural world through painting, silk screening, collage, and pondering the endless possibilities of chocolate. Grandpa Coco is 2020 Kaba Honor Book. It is her first authored illustrated book and a love letter to the grandfather she never knew. Let's welcome both Adrian Wright and Elizabeth Zunon and we will start with Adrian. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and present today. I'm really excited to um, speak about Hector. Um, thank you. I'm not sure if you could see me before. Um, my book is Hector, a boy, a protest and the photograph that changed apartheid, um, published last year. And it's my debut book. And I'm really excited to share the art, uh, which I made along with, along with writing the book. Um, my my book, Hector, relays the story of the Soweto school protest, uh, which started on June 16, 1976. Soweto is a township outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. And um, the, what led to the protest was that the children were told that they would have to start learning their subjects in Afrikaans, which they considered the language of the oppressive government, and they wanted to carry on learning in English. So um, they protested and um, the protest march started off peacefully until the police came along and started firing on the children and they were particularly angered when the children started singing 
a beautiful hymn called Mkosi Sikaleli Africa. And um, they open fire on the police. And Hector is, um, Hector has become the symbol for that protest. And he, um, the iconic photograph that inspired me to write the book is this one by photojournalist Sam and Zima of Hector being carried by a stranger and with his sister running alongside them. And um, to make it as authentic as possible, um, I did a lot of research and for the scenes where I couldn't find visual reference, um, I used anecdotes from interviews with Hector's mother, whom I met, and Hector's sister, who's in the photograph, and then also the photographer. So I'm going to share my screen now and present the PowerPoint. Okay, does everyone see that? Yes, we do. Great, thank you. Okay, reading illustrations in picture books. I just have a quick word about illustrators and it is to just define a picture book author. Um, sometimes one person writes the words and another person makes the images with illustrations or photographs. Other times, one person does both. The general assumption of who an author is is that the author writes the story and the illustrator makes images to reflect the words and that makes a picture book. My view is that a writer writes the words, an illustrator tells the story in, in a separate layer or extends the story with images. Both are authors. Picture books wouldn't exist without images, therefore illustrators are also authors. In this case, I did both, so um, I'm okay with that. Um, so this is the cover of Hector, and I'm going to talk about the art in Hector and show some of my research and um, references. So this is the photograph that inspired it all, and photographer Sam and Zima um, said this. I saw a child fall down. Under a shower of bullets, I rushed forward and went for the picture. It had been a peaceful march. The children were told to disperse. They started singing Nkosi Sikale, the police were ordered to shoot. And um, when I came across this photograph again after many years, I was inspired to find out more about this boy, Hector, what had happened to his family and the photographer. Um, this is how the photograph appeared the day of the shooting that evening in a newspaper called The World, which Sam and Zima worked for. The photograph was reproduced on the front page. The next day, it was all over the world. The picture on the right is a newspaper in the UK, so it really did spread worldwide. This is Sam and Zima on the left, the photographs of him uh, when he was um, working for the World newspaper. The middle photograph is him later on in life with the photograph that made him so famous. And then on the right is my illustration of Sam. And my book is divided into three, um, three narratives, three perspectives. And I've got a portrait of each storyteller at the beginning of each section. And that is, the, that is Sam's section, the story told from Stan, Sam's point of view. These are the other photographs that were taken in a sequence. He just kept snapping photographs as the boy ran down the road with Hector and Hector's sister Antoinette running alongside him. And then he was put into the journalist's car to take him to a nearby clinic. So that is, um, that is Antoinette getting into the car with Hector. These were very early sketches I did before I had a contract, before I had even written the book. I started working on um, concept sketches for how I would like to tell a story if I ever did manage to get it published. And I'm very pleased to say that a couple of these images did make it in some form into the final book, which I'll show you later on. 
in a visit to South Africa, I met with Antoinette, who is um, Hector's oldest sister, and Hector's mother, Mrs. Dorothy Molefi. And um, I was very privileged to be invited to her home and um, also went with them to the cemetery where Hector is buried. That is Hector's mother putting flowers at his grave. When I started working on my book and started doing sketches, I needed a model for a lot of action um, sequences that I was going to show in my graphic novel style book. And I was very lucky to have a friend, a very good friend of mine, whose son was just the right age. And he came along and was very patient with me as I asked him to do some crazy poses. And he just did whatever I wanted. And he came many times over a couple of years, actually. So you'll see him growing up a bit. Um, all of these photographs made it into specific scenes in the book. Um, he was very obliging, as you can see. <laughs> um, these are some early sketches I did of um, my young friend Joseph and how I turned him into Hector, changed his hairstyle. Um, just some more initial sketches of how I was going to draw him. And I, I also considered working on um, newspaper cutouts, um, cuttings. I, I found a lot of uh, press cuttings that um, spoke about the, the protest and um, I started working on newspaper for some sketches, but that would have, I found that it would have been too complicated. So I landed up just using some um, collage pieces in the illustration. So you'll find bits of specific newspaper articles in some of the illustrations in the book. This is how a book begins. Uh, well, this is how I begin it. It's called a thumbnail layout to see how the book is going to be laid out, how, what goes on each page, what will make an interesting page turn. And this, so this was my initial layout of the book when it was going to be a 40 page book. Um, it landed up being a 48 page book. Luckily I had lots of room to work. Um, and then these are my final sketches I did, what my publisher called tight sketches, where I would do very very tight specific sketches to the right size, to the final size and send them to the publisher and the editor for their feedback. And we made some changes here and there and then they would give me the go ahead to start the final art. This is one spread, which is actually the beginning of the book. And um, it shows the graphic novel style of the book because I have lots of small panels with lots of detail and lots of dialogue. So I needed to find a way to show lots of, excuse me, lots of separate scenes on each page. And um, just to give you an idea of the kind of reference I used, um, this woman is wearing a dress made from fabric called Shreshwe, which I used in the uh, woman on the right-hand page, middle panel. So she's wearing a Shreshwe. Um, dress, so I use some fabric for that. And the little boy in front of her wheeling a little wire car, um, children would make their own toys and, and especially cars quite a lot in South Africa if they didn't have their own bought toys. And um, just another little reference to something that is specifically South African, um, lion, the lion and lion matches is on the wall under the spaza shop. A spaza is like an informal store that people would um, start in, you know, a corner of their home or a window or abandoned building um, to sell to lo local people um, e everyday supplies because big supermarkets were not available and people would just be able to walk to the local, um, almost like a 7-Eleven, but not quite. Um, this spread also show, um, shows Hector um, doing what he loved to do. Um, he loved karate and he loved to watch Bruce Lee movies. So I put up the scene of him going to his Saturday afternoon movies at the local church. Um, and just a, an example of uh, being specific about reference. 
I had started drawing uh, one of those portable screens that you can hook up and show a movie on. Um, but when I asked Antoinette, Hector's sister, about how they watched movies, she said, oh, that sounded very fancy. They didn't have something like that. They've just put up a sheet. So then I could put that in the illustration and make it more authentic. And then under that, um, a scene from a movie, which is fictitious, I couldn't use, I couldn't really use Bruce Lee. Um, the mountain behind them, um, I've used some newspaper cutting, which if you look at the detail, speaks specifically about the security police in South Africa and, um, and uh, the minister of police and how they um, abused power and um, attacked the pro protesters on the day of the uh, protest, June 16th. And then the bottom shot is the children watching the movie and I've put in a little reference. I wasn't allowed to use specific um, name brands for copyright reasons, but I've put in um, a local brand of chips, uh, potato chips without putting in the actual logo, but just a reference to that. And illustrators do this a lot, just put in things for themselves, not really um, specific to the story. And again, the pictures on the right show um, many of the references that I used of my friend's son. So he did all these specific poses. The spread shows um, the morning of June 16th when Hector's getting ready to go to school and that's the last time he sees his mother. And um, he meets his friend and they go off. He actually had to walk, catch a train and walk again to get to school. It was a long journey. Um, getting up at six in the morning. And um, again, just looking at it as an overall page image, um, I wanted to be specific in my color choices. So the train and the bar of soap were about the same color. So I used that to keep my palette kind of limited. Um, the spread shows um, the crowd of children as they are marching, their peaceful march, and then this kind of arrow shape dynamic I've got on the left page with the police forming their own little arrow, which has a gun pointing at Hector on the other page. Um, this is all um, also, intro also introducing the sound of the anthem that they're singing, which um, which actually made the police uh, turn on them and fire on them. Um, the, the loudspeaker that the policeman has also has um, newspaper collage in it that is, that is uh, uh, relevant to what's happening there. And also the, the bands around the policeman's um, caps is um, just me being a little bit facetious. Um, it's actually a bubblegum wrapper that I've put around their heads. That's again, it's not really necessary to know that when reading the story, but I put it in there for myself really. Um, this spread shows um, when Hector, Hector is picked up by the other boy um, and his sister didn't notice at first who it was, but she recognized his shoe because he had very specific, she told me mustard color shoes with an orange stripe on them that was similar to a sneaker. Um, so I used the shoe image uh, a few times during the book. And then also, um, this is where the, oh, more shwe shwe in the curtains, fabrics. Um, and then also using this photograph to really see how, was when I first noticed that Hector was, had only one shoe on. And so the shoe and the last shoe became an important image for me in the book. And then also the car which we saw earlier in different, um, different uh, forms. Um, and then again, the car, my early sketch of it, my second sketch of it, uh, which I liked, but I couldn't use it because the buildings behind the car weren't accurate to what was happening in that neighborhood. It wasn't a shanty town. It was a decent, well, not decent neighborhood, but a neighborhood with, um, small four-roomed houses, so I had to reflect that more accurately. 
and that is Hector's mother's house. So that is the house that Hector lived in. Um, at the time, there was no electricity. So you see, you see a satellite dish there. It, it didn't exist at the time, obviously, but there was no electricity and no hot water in the house, just a cold water tap in the kitchen sink. The spread shows Antoinette in her grandmother's kitchen, and I used reference from Hector's house as well. This is the stove, so I used the stove, um, put it in the grandmother's house, and then also used some specific details, um, like the loaf of bread. Um, in South Africa, the regular supposedly government loaf, we call them government loaves, um, were baked in tins that had the name of the bakery on the side of the tin, so that would come out in, in re relief on the side of the bread. So that's the name of the bakery from my hometown. And there are, in the corner is a, is a packet of sugar. Again, I couldn't put the name of the sugar in there, but I just wanted to put, um, be as kind of generically accurate as possible, shall I say. Um, this page shows um, Hector, Hector and his friend arriving at a, one of the places where students were gathering to go on the march. And um, just wanted to show you, oh, there's the policeman's uh, bubblegum wrapper cap again. And then this is an image of how I work. I start off illustrations. Um, so in the middle of this um, picture is how the left-hand illustration started. Um, so I work in pastels, and that's me working on a board against a wall with all my references and my kite sketch. And um, that's how I start. And then I finish on a drawing table, which I'll show you in a little while. Um, these are photographs of the actual protest. So um, as you can see, there were thousands of students marching, mostly happily singing, carrying banners, and that's what I try to portray in my um, kind of most busily referenced image in the book. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted the reader to see, um, to kind of feel like they were right in the middle of this crowd and see see and feel and hear everything. So this image was in my very first um, dummy of the book, uh, long before I got my, um, my contract with the publisher. So this, this idea made it through um, each stage and landed up in the final book. So this was the tight sketch for this image. And then um, working on it in pieces, it took uh, the longest of all my illustrations because there were so many details to put in and I wanted to use specific people as a kind of homage to a lot of people who you may or may not recognize some of them but um, I've put in some famous people and people who have become well known because um, because of who they are so I'll just go through some of the names quickly um, Jordan Edwards Tamir Rice Antoine Rose, Martin Luther King Jr., Nelson Mandela, Emmett Till, Stompy Sepe, he's South African, John Lewis, my hero, Koto Sitlolo, South African, Charlotte Makele, South African, Steve Biko, South African, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tietzi Mashanini, he was actually one of the leaders of the protest and Victoria Nfege, also South African. And then, um, again, not necessary to know if you're reading the book, but just um, an homage to these brave people. And then I also wanted to add the sound of, or try to add the sound, invoke the sound of the anthem that they were singing in Kosi Sikaleli Africa, which has actually now become the national anthem of South Africa. And it's a beautiful song, and I'm just going to play it for a few seconds.
So that was part of Nkosi Sikaleli Africa, which was originally, at the time that the children were singing it, it was banned. And of course, playing it or singing it angered the police. Um, and uh, now I'm going to go on to show you some of the references I used or pieces of newspaper that I used in the actual collage for illustrations. And um, these I found um, through various means at uh, the National Library of South Africa in Pretoria. I went through their microfilm and made photocopies of these uh, newspaper pages. Um, also at the University of the Witwatersrand Historical Papers Archive. Uh, Bits University is the main English-speaking university in Johannesburg. And then also I have a personal scrapbook which is about my sister, Claire Wright, who was a student representative council uh, president at uh, Wits University. And she was very active in uh, student politics and she got into a bit of good trouble herself. So I used um, newspaper clippings from this too, even though this was in the mid eighties when there was a real um, security police crackdown. So anything that you see in the book relating to Claire Wright is actually from a different, slightly different era, but still relevant, I think. Um, this image shows the materials, the art materials that I used for this book. Um, I used chalk pastels, pastel pencils, um, pan pastels, or those round things at the top, um, which are applied with sponges and um, are great for the small, the small areas and the very small illustrations in the pages with many panels. And then um, also use sponges. So everything's very messy. Um, and then this illustration is one of the few that has no dialogue and no narrative text. And um, I try to invoke what was happening just with the image and then the sound effect words. Um, so I was hoping that this would tell the story of what happened when Hector and his sister Antoinette part ways. They run in different directions. That's the end of one uh, sequence in the book. And um, we were talking about upstanders earlier. Um, I didn't know that, but apparently I'm not the first person to think of um, being an upstander. What I like to do with um, school and library visits is to get uh, the students to think about how they would like to be an upstander um, and um, stand up for something that they believe in. And um, if you would like to see um, more resources and a teacher's guide and a worksheet, um, they'll, you can find them on my website. And um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Zunan. I am the illustrator and the author of Grandpa Cacao, A Tale of Chocolate from Farm to Family. Um, and let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you all and talk a little bit about my process for illustrating this book. Um, this is the first book that I illustrated. I mean, the first book that I um, wrote as well as illustrated. And um, I've illustrated about a dozen books before this. Um, I did a lot of research to try to um, write a story that was really important to me. And um, the story that's that's been really important to me for a very long time now is the story of my grandfather. 
my grandfather, whom I never met um, in the Ivory Coast or Cote d'Ivoire, West Africa, which is where I grew up. Um, could you let me know if you can um, share, my, if you are able to see my screen at this moment? I am. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm gonna share the art ingredients for Grandpa Cacao. So moving backwards from the final paintings, which are in the book, to the sketches and then the reference photographs that I use. To create the art for this book, I used uh, mainly oil paint and acrylic paint, as well as cut paper collage and silk screening. And this book is about chocolate. It's about where chocolate comes from. So I ate a lot of chocolate um, to inspire myself, right? To create this artwork. So my first authored illustrated book, Grandpa Cacao, tells a fictionalized um, account of the story of my grandfather in the Ivory Coast. Um, it's inspired by my father's childhood stories and um, our family life on a cacao plantation and our, um, our love of chocolate. As you learned from Dr. Bond in the introduction, wherever we lived, whether it was the United States or the Ivory Coast, there was always a lot of chocolate in the house. Um, so in this book, a little girl and her dad bake a chocolate cake while she learns about her grandfather, a cacao plantation owner, harvesting and preparing the cacao fruits, which will be used to make chocolate. So um, it stemmed from an idea that I had in art school probably about 14, 15 years ago, and it's gone through a lot of different transformations over the years. It started off as um, my senior year project in, in art school. Um, so it's been kind of in a closet, in a drawer since then. And I've been thinking about it, trying to figure out how can I make this a viable picture book that um, young children might be interested in. So the thing that stemmed, the, the, from which the whole idea stemmed was a project that I did about um, interviewing family members. I interviewed my father. He talked about his childhood in the Ivory Coast. And one of the things he talked about was walking with his brother and his mother to their father's cacao farm and helping their father cut those cacao fruits off of the trees. So, a lot of my art school projects were somehow related to cacao or the cacao pod itself, the fruit itself, or chocolate or candy or cake or cooking. So these are some of my, my art school projects inspired by that, that first interview with my father about walking through the cacao farm. So for this children's picture book, I thought, okay, I love learning about things, how things are made. I love baking. So I can write a book about where chocolate comes from, how it is made, and teach the readers how you can make a chocolate cake um, all while learning. How can I write a story? I always tell young students, I write what I know, I research what I don't know, I talk to people, and I have a lot of different uh, learning experiences in my process. It's not just drawing pictures and writing words. I have to engage in different activities to feel like I understand um, more details about the story, more details about the lives of the people living the story. And when I write my text, I like to think about word choice and active tense. In the book, Grandpa Cacao, I'm talking about um, grandpa in the past tense. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I referred to him as somebody who existed a long time ago, but somebody who's still relevant today. So I tried to tell his story um, um, without sounding too passive. And then another thing that I was sure to do was eliminate phrases in the text that describe the art, especially phrases that have reference to colors. Um, instead of focusing on the sound and the shape of the words when the words are read aloud. And this is an example I like to share. Um, I like to use um, verbs that young children might be able to identify with. For example, he sliced through the skins, I sprinkle in the salt, they scooped out the beans. So the more that I can make um, situations in the book that young folks can relate to, I think that would be um, more interesting for a young reader. If they can identify a time in their life when they sprinkled in salt or, or, or sugar into their food, slice through an apple maybe, or scoop out a scoop of ice cream from a tub. 
So a question I asked myself before I sat down to write the text is how can I illustrate the past and present on the same page without being confusing? The thing that I decided to do is sort of create a visual language that the reader can understand. So this is kind of um, um, how I break down my, my creative process. So the memory, the vision or the character informs the story. The story informs the visual language and the visual language informs writing with visual cues. So for example, my memory, my vision, my character is um, this, this art piece that I did while I was a student of my father and his brother walking with their mother through these uh, cacao trees. So that image influenced the story. So how can I get this image into my book? Well, the story will become a girl and her father in the current day baking a chocolate cake while learning what happens on this particular farm where Grandpa Cacao planted and harvested the fruits for chocolate making. That then informs the visual language. How am I going to depict this? How am I going to depict people in different countries, in different um, times in history, and in different, um, different places? So I use paint, collage, and screen print. I painted the current day uh, child and her father baking the chocolate cake. I also use collage to um, infuse some elements of Ivorian uh, dress and culture. And then I use screen, print, screen printing technique to show Grandpa Cacao in the past, sort of as a like a mythological ghostly figure uh, walking through this West African landscape. Another thing that helped me is writing with visu visual cues. In addition to ingesting a lot of chocolate while I was writing and illustrating, um, I find that I need to have objects in front of me that I can look at, that I can touch, that I can smell, that I can feel, that sort of cheer me on as I'm writing. And I feel like these objects help to fuel the memory, the vision and stoke kind of the creative fires. Um, and so I feel like when I'm stuck, when I'm writing or illustrating, if I look at or touch one of my visual cues, it helps me to, to sort of pull the story out. So the visual cues that I used here um, on the bottom, you can see a, a photo of these ceramic um, cacao pods that I that I made when I was a student. So I had a couple of these pods sitting at, on my desk as I was working on my story. So my creative process is really about weaving different worlds together into one story or combining different ingredients together into making a cake, which is a story. I ate a lot of chocolate, um, have chocolate in a couple different spots in my home. Um, chocolate from everywhere. And I thought, you know what, I, I'm writing about chocolate, so I need to experience how chocolate makes me feel. Every illustration in this book comes from real life. Um, I use a lot of reference photos of my family, my father, myself, my little brother, my mother. Um, in addition to helping me draw characters that look realistic on the page, um, and especially if I'm drawing characters that exist in, in real life, my family, I want to draw them accurately. And another way that working from photographs helps me as an illustrator is it helps me figure out where the highlights and the shadows fall on the skin. Um, painting portraits is my absolute favorite thing to do. And I just love painting the highlights on foreheads and, and cheeks and the tips of noses. Um, so I love looking at photographs of real people to, to help me figure out how I can make my portraits look as realistic as possible. Um, I looked also at photographs of actual cacao workers from my father's farm in, um, in the, the town of Daloa in the Ivory Coast. So these are some of the, the men that do the work that I describe in the book. If you look closely behind them um, on this, this cacao tree, which has this pale gray or white bark, you can see um, an orange fruit growing right off of the tree trunk. So this is one of the cacao fruits that folks cut off of the tree, cut open, scoop out the beans, ferment the beans, dry the beans, and prepare to send to um, a, a chocolate factory. So I figured that I would um, share the first couple of images from the book and then show you how I arrived to this, the process of the final image. So the story begins, chocolate is my most favorite thing ever. For my birthday, Daddy and I are making our family's special celebration cake while Mommy goes to pick up another treat. 
every one of us loves this cake, even my little brother, Denny, who is the pickiest of picky eaters. Chocolate is a gift to you from Grandpa Cacao, Daddy says. We can only enjoy chocolate treats, thanks to farmers like him. The story continues. And at this point, the little girl and her dad are combining the um, chocolate cake ingredients into their bowl. And behind them, we can see an image of Grandpa Cacao and dad as a teenager putting the dried beans into these big burlap sacks. So I arrived at that final image using um, painted with oil paint and collage and silkscreen. After arriving at this pencil sketch where I planned out where all the characters were going to go, um, here you can see that final image kind of in, in process of being creating. On the left, you can see I'm painting the highlight on the, the measuring cup that dad is holding in his hand. And on the right, you can see the beginnings of the um, screen print that I'm painting onto my, um, my, my screen. Here, if we turn back the clock a little bit, you can see the image as it's maybe 50% um, finished. I use oil paint, but I use my oil paint on top of a bright orange acrylic painted background. So everything that you see in this image that is bright orange is um, an area that has not yet been covered by either paint or collage. Here we're rolling back the clock even further where I've only painted the sky, the skin tone of the characters, the trees and the ground and the cacao in the forefront. And then on the bottom, we can see some of the reference images that I use of actual cacao farmers in Africa and the work, the backbreaking work that they're doing um, to prepare these beautiful cacao beans so that we can have chocolate. And then rolling back the clock even further, here we've got my reference photos of myself pretending to be my dad, pouring the ingredients into the bowl and pretending to be my little seven-year-old self cracking an egg into the bowl. Uh, the story continues on and the little girl is imagining what it would like to, to meet Grandpa Cacao. Um, in real life, I never met my grandfather. I've never seen a photograph of him. So this was kind of um, making an imagined character in my mind come to life on the page. So here, uh, the young girl is holding her, her bowl of um, chocolate cake batter and imagining that Grandpa Cacao is kind of right next to her. Here's the sketch that um, informs that final painting. Here is the final painting kind of midway. Um, I like to put a lot of different um, Easter eggs or, or surprises in the art for myself. So on the top left, you can see um, a postcard of Abidjan, which is the city that I grew up in and we can see the Abidjan skyline. Um, so I painted that skyline into one of the, the paintings behind the girl on the wall. And then in the middle on the top, we can see the Ivory Coast um, coat of arms, which I painted on in another painting behind her on the wall. So I'm using a lot of references to my own childhood, um, to the colors of the Ivorian flag, which are orange, white, and green. There's a lot of orange, white, and green in all of the illustrations. Here we can see um, I've painted the skin, I've painted the wall behind her, the floor behind her, and um, Grandpa Cacao's uh, load of cacao pods before I added the painting, the collage, and the silkscreen element. Here I am pretending to be that little seven-year-old me, imagining what it might be like to see Grandpa Cacao in the flesh. And then on the right, we can see the silkscreen that I have started to paint um, to create kind of that, that stencil white image of Grandpa Cacao for the page. Um, here we have Daddy and the little girl tasting that chocolate batter, chocolate cake batter that they've now created. We've got the sketch. And a, a close up of my desk here, you can see the, the illustration is, is being created. Um, once my oil paint is drying on the page, I dive through my collection of collected um, papers and fabrics to see what flat elements can I add to the page, what colorful or patterned elements can I add to make the illustration more dynamic. 
So if you look closely, you'll notice that the aprons that both of these characters are wearing are made up of a patchwork of squares and, and stripes. And each one of these pattern squares or stripes is taken straight from something from my childhood in the Ivory Coast. So one of daddy's patchwork squares on his apron comes from my fifth grade um, pencil case, which is made of uh, African fabric, which we call fagne. And another square of his apron comes from um, a very well-known African um, pagne that a lot of ladies wore um, in the 80s and 90s when I lived in the Ivory Coast. And um, this particular image on the left, on the bottom, is a, a, a painting that I did in high school here in the United States, referring back to my childhood in the Ivory Coast. Here we can see, turning back the clock, um, I've got my acrylic paint uh, solid layer, and then I've got my brown skin tones and hair color with my highlights on the faces. And here we've got the photographs that inspired um, those paintings of pretending to taste that chocolate cake batter. Um, here we have got um, the chocolate cake is being poured into the cake tin. The cake tin gets put into the oven and the little girl is looking through um, the, the, the oven door, hoping that her chocolate cake is baking correctly. The sketch that inspired that painting. And then my desk, as I'm working on the final painting, I've got um, strips of, of paper that I'm cutting out for the oven rack. Um, you can see the, the metallic silver paper in the corner that I've used as the, the cake tin and with my scissors and my sketch and my pencils and my glue on my desk. Here are the reference images that I used to create that final artwork. I've got a nice um, marble um, gray and white cutting board. I've got my chocolate cake batter being poured into a cake tin the cake tin in the oven baking and myself pretending to be that excited seven-year-old girl waiting for her chocolate cake to bake. Um, one of the last images of the book shows grandpa arriving at the door as a uh, birthday surprise for the little girl. Here we see the living room where uh, we've got a wooden door and some images on the wall. We've got the sketch to create that final image, that final painting. And the sketch is taken straight from my own parents' living room here in Albany, New York, where they've got a blue wall, they've got a wooden door, and they've got a couple of images on the wall. Um, one of the images that they have is their uh, wedding portrait the day that they got married here in Albany. And another image that they have on the wall is a painting that I did while I was a student um, in, in art school. And then here, if you look closely, you can see myself and my little brother, who is now very much taller than me, um, he helped me out and posed in a couple of at, at a couple of different times when I needed someone to stand in for a very tall, um, very lean Grandpa Cacao as he shows up in the book. Grandpa Cacao brings as a gift an actual cacao pod for the little girl in the book. Um, here we've got the sketch of that image. And then the illustration in progress with the orange paint in the background and then the brown skin tones. Um, I worked from images of my own face, looking at my father's face and my brother's face. And at the end of this book, um, we have a lot, little bit of information about um, what happens at the chocolate factory. So a lot of work happens on the farm, the cacao farm. Um, all of the beans are dried, gathered, packed up into burlap sacks, and then sold to middlemen. Middlemen will then sell these beans to chocolate factories, oftentimes in Europe or in the United States. And I could do a whole other book about what happens in a chocolate factory, the roasting of the beans, the, the um, grinding of the beans, the adding of the, the milk, um, sugar and a lot of different other ingredients to make a smooth, silky chocolate bar.
we've got the chocolate celebration cake recipe from the book, the book that the little girl, uh, the, the cake that the little girl and her father bake in the story. Um, in addition to eating a lot of chocolate while working on this book, I baked a lot of chocolate cakes. I wanted to come out, come up with my own chocolate cake recipe that was easy to follow, easy to read, and, and had uh, the least amount of um, ingredients as possible. So I took a lot of pictures of my different attempts at making um, a perfect chocolate cake. And then on the bottom right, we can see um, a square of fabric here, which is a piece of pagne, a piece of African fabric that I used um, as the tablecloth here in the image where the chocolate cake is sitting um, in the dish next to the cacao pod. Another Easter egg that I added for myself and for any reader that might um, uh, come upon it in the book is my favorite book when I was young was The Snowy, the Snowy Day, written and illustrated by Ezra Jack Keats. Um, so I wanted to, to make a little bit of a, an homage to The Snowy Day um, at the back of this book. So here we can see uh, the little girl and her grandpa are walking through the backyard um, and it's snowing and we have these blue snowflakes falling around them. And this is a reference to the last page in The Snowy Day where Peter and his friend are walking in the backyard during a snowfall. So I love to add different, just little different nuggets that make the story a little bit more richer for myself and hopefully a little bit more rich um, for the people that are reading the story. I also have some information in the back of the book about um, how I created the art, the realities of the cacao trade. Um, we hear a lot about um, fair trade chocolate and child labor in the cacao industry. And there are a lot of things that we as consumers can do to learn more, educate ourselves and um, promote brands of chocolate that, that are grown, that are used, your, used cacao used with um, fair trade practices. We've got a map about um, a map of the world showing the, the cacao belt, showing where in the world cacao is grown. It's grown near the equator in hot tropical places like the Ivory Coast, Mexico, and Indonesia. So the realities of the cacao trade. Um, in recent years, we've heard a lot of stories about child labor in the cacao industry. A lot of children do help out on their family farms and there's a long history of exploitation. This goes back to the colonial era of forced labor. Um, there's a current effort by a lot of the big candy companies like Hershey to ensure that the cacao that they buy doesn't come from farms where child or slave labor is used. The government of the Ivory Coast is also trying its best to clamp down on such practices. Um, there's a lot of ele moving elements um, in this equation of cacao and chocolate and it's, it's really up to everybody at every level to play their part. As a consumer, we can look for a chocolate that is certified as fair trade, meaning that it was harvested without child labor or slave labor, and that the cacao farmer received a fair price for his or her beans. Um, fair trade is a global movement made up of a diverse network of producers, companies, consumers, advocates, and organizations putting people and planet first. So I encourage everyone when buying chocolate, when buying coffee, when buying anything that, that is grown abroad, even within the United States to look for this um, fair trade certified seal. Now fair trade um, did not exist when grandpa Cacao himself worked his farm. Um, my grandfather worked his farm in the 1940s and 50s before fair trade was a thing. It was a small family farm, everybody helped out. Um, most of our chocolate comes from small family farms, just like my grandfather's, where everybody in the village gets together to help out. Um, and a lot of these farms are actually not fair trade certified. You need to be able to pay for, pay for your fair trade certification. And a lot of these small family farmers just cannot afford that. Um, 
Cacao farmers often live below their country's national poverty lines. Um, in the Ivory Coast, um, cacao is a really big point of pride for everybody. We come from the land of cacao, the land of cocoa, the land of chocolate. But the reality is a lot of the people that grow this beautiful fruit are poorer um, than a lot of the other farmers within that, those, those countries. So what happens is a lot of these farms end up employing migrant workers from neighboring countries. Um, and a lot of these farms, especially in the Ivory Coast, where my father, the area where my father is from, the farms are in or near conflict ridden areas. So we have to remember that the chocolate that we eat comes from places where there's a lot of different um, forces at play and a lot of things going on on the ground. On average, a cacao farmer makes six cents for every $1 we spend on a chocolate bar. Um, and this is, I think, a really crazy number. Every, every time you buy a, a Hershey bar for 99 cents or a dollar, the farmer who grew those beans is probably making about six cents. And it's hard to make a living on six cents um, on something that is prized as a very luxurious, sometimes very sexy final product. Um, the life of a, of a cacao farmer is not luxurious, is not sexy. <laughs> Ivory Coast farmers earn about 91 cents a day for their labor. 70% um, of our chocolate comes from cacao that is grown in small family farms in the Ivory Coast and Ghana. So within um, a farmer's um, harvesting life, he will chop, carry, open, scoop, bury, stir, haul the beans, spread the beans, turn the beans, cover the beans, bag the cacao beans. And I always like to share with young students, wouldn't you like to make more than 91 cents a day if you had to do all of this backbreaking work? Here we have images of, um, you know, all of the different processes that go through, that go on in, in making our, our cacao, our chocolate um, from this, this beautiful fruits that grow in a very specific part of the world that are harvested by farmers that are living below the poverty line. And this is the kind of work that isn't able to be mechanized. Um, robots can't go through a plantation and pluck the correct fruits that are ready to be harvested and can't do this precise work of cutting open the cacao fruits, scooping out the pods, the beans, fermenting them, stirring them, drying them. Um, so I think I call on everybody to eat chocolate and treasure all chocolate. Whether it is certified fair trade or not, chocolate was grown by someone who put a lot of their heart and soul and and body and hands and love into making um, making something beautiful for us to to enjoy. There are a couple of different related classroom activities that I like to to share. Um, obviously, it's always a fun idea if if you can bake the cake and think about where each of the ingredients of the cake came from. Um, when I have a big group of students, I like to, to invite them to design their own chocolate bar wrapper. After reading the story, what are the things that you uh, remember or think are important to learn about when you are going to eat chocolate or something made from chocolate? Um, investigating the life of a farmer, how much hard work takes it takes to, to make a final product that you can just go to the store and, and buy without thinking about it. And then I also, also like to think about um, sort of a, a worldwide meal map. Everything, every meal that we eat has elements that come from far away, from nearby, from just around the corner. Even if I bought an ingredient um, at the grocery store just around the corner, that ingredient probably came from very far away. So I think it'd be a fun activity to, to create um, a meal map for every meal that we eat throughout the day especially for young kids to, to understand that food comes from a lot of different places. So I learned a lot about um, harvesting cacao, growing cacao, making chocolate when I was working on this book. 
And I hope that um, you're inspired to learn about, maybe learn a little bit about where your food comes from the next time you have um, a yummy chocolate treat. So I thank you very much. And um, I think we, we might be open for questions. I'd like to thank you both, Adrienne and Elizabeth. We do have a number of questions. So I'll start with one question directed toward Adrienne and one toward Elizabeth. Adrienne, you first, uh, okay. I'll read that. Uh, what has your attribution process been around the child in your life who you modeled Hector's likeness after? Is the child you modeled after listed as your creative collaborator? If not, how do you think artists should approach attribution in these communal, collaborative, creative processes of making art? Wow, oh, thank you. Um, so you're talking about my little model. Um, his name's Joseph, and I do uh, acknowledge him in the, in the back of my book, in the acknowledgements. I've got a very long list of people. And um, I say a special thank you to Joseph VT for patience, humor, and inspiring poses. You were the perfect Hector stand-in. Um, and he is my very good friend's son. And so I see him often. And um, he came over. You know, he was a kid when he was doing it. And I used to give him money, like a little bit of money when he came over. And um, does, that, does that answer the question, if there's anything else you'd like to know about him. Okay. Well, we'll just kind of switch switch back and forth. Okay. You know, question to you. And I was just thinking, though, as I was listening to you both, um, I spent some time in Soweto in South Africa oh. uh, with his kids there. So I had a familiar setting. And then Elizabeth, I spent some time in, um, uh, in Ghana for my PhD. And so I know a little bit about that. So let's switch a question. For Elizabeth and we'll go back and forth. Um, give me just time here to scroll down. Uh, accolades about you, they love how personal the book is involving your family history uh, and images, like the activism and the question is, where can we donate to help farmers get their fair trade certification? Oh, a great question. Huh. I don't know if there is somewhere that we can donate for them to get their certification. Um, I always like to promote um, Divine Chocolate. They are a brand um, in Ghana that works with a, a cooperative of, of small family farms, just like in, in the book. Um, and they do a lot of advocacy around not only promoting fair trade practices, but also implementing um, programs on the ground where we work like educational programs for the children of the farmers, um, programs for um, um, women's empowerment as well. Um, yeah, so I would, I would um, suggest um, um, promoting divine chocolates. And then also I see, um, I see someone who just posted a link here um, about fairtradecertified.org slash donate, yes. Okay, thank you. We have a question. Um, Another question for Adrian. Uh, let's see here. Is Afrikaan the South African language? Why does it say they don't want Afrikaan? Okay. Um, sorry if my explanation during the presentation was a bit confusing. So during apartheid, Africa is called Afrikaans with an S on the end, and English with a two national main nationally recognized languages. And Afrikaans is a derivative of Dutch with a little bit of German and French as well, but mostly Dutch. Um, and, and the Dutch colonized South Africa in the 1600s. So the language uh, became the dominant language and became the language of, of, of the apartheid government while they were in power during apartheid. And English was the other main language. And for the most part, uh, students were taught in, in schools in English. All their textbooks were in English. Um, most of the um, science uh, language, uh, science courses were taught in English, etc. And then the government came up with this 
very bad idea to start teaching in Afrikaans and the teachers didn't have the equipment to, to do that. Um, they didn't want Afrikaans because um, black people viewed it as the language of the oppressor. So they, that's why they protested against it. And um, they also learned some subjects, kind of less important subjects, I guess, um, in, their, in their home language, like Zulu and Sutu and Kosa, et cetera. So, that, so they wanted to carry on learning everything in English. That's why they protested. And now, um, now post-apartheid, South Africa recognizes 11 languages as nationally recognized languages. So it's a country of 11 languages. We had a question around, I think it's probably addressed to, to both of you. Do you have any upcoming new works that's uh, in, in process that we should look forward to if you feel like announcing them to both of you? You go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, yes. Um, let's see. In the beginning of January, 2021, my, me my next book will be published. Um, it is called Off to See the Sea. It is not an African story. I am the illustrator, um, not the, the author. The author is Nikki Grimes. Um, and currently I'm working on um, my second authored illustrated book. And that book is not about chocolate, but it's about salt. And um, I am also beginning final artwork for um, a book. Um, it's an artist biography of the um, artist El Anatsui, who is from Ghana. He lives in Nigeria and he creates artwork using recycled liquor bottle caps. So I'm really excited to, to um, illustrate sort of his artistic process. So that'll be coming coming. 2021, maybe 2022. Uh, and how about your other Kaba winner, Elizabeth? Ah, uh, yes, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind um, was a, a Kaba winner. I do you believe. have a book that you could show? I mean, do you have a cover that you could? Um, I don't think I have one in here. Um, I could, no, I don't think I have one in here. <laughs> the Boy Who Harnessed okay. the Wind, um, written by William Kampwamba and Brian Mueller tells a true story of um, William Kamkwamba in Malawi, East Africa, who built a working windmill out of pieces of junk from, trash from the junkyard. Um, he's a real person. He is a couple years younger than I am. And he's done a lot of work um, with um, wind engineering, solar power, um, and he's a really inspiring figure. And then also we have um, one plastic bag Isatu Sise and the Recycling Women of the Gambia, um, a Kaba honor book, um, which tells the story of Isatu Sise in the Gambia, who um, it teaches people about um, the benefits of recycling, of uh, living in a, in a clean environment, and using discarded plastic shopping bags. Um, and she crochets them into beautiful purses. and other fashion accessories. So she's she's another very inspiring person working today to, to make our world um, a cleaner, better, more beautiful place. Wonderful. Now, if I've missed any questions and you have other questions, please feel free to type, the, to, uh, uh, type them into the chat area while we wait, since we do have a few more minutes. I have a question or two that I might address to you as we wait to get other questions. Uh, I'll start with Adrian and then I'll go to Elizabeth. Uh, Adrian, um, it was very moving when you said you had met Hector's mother. Uh, mm -hmm. What was her response to the, your drawing of Hector as well as the story? Um, I, I didn't hear much from her. I'm in touch with Antoinette a lot, um, Hector's sister. Um, we're still in touch. His, um, Hector's mother is very um, kind of old school, very reticent. Um, she liked the book and she said that the way I portrayed Hector um, on the cover um, 
actually looked like one of her grandchildren. So she was happy about that. <laughs> um, again, um, I just, um, and, and, and Antoinette, his sister, um, loved it and she would like to get more copies. Um, she's also, she's a motivational speaker and she speaks at schools and um, all over the place. Um, and she, she, I've given her a number of copies um, and I'm trying to get it published in South Africa. That hasn't happened yet, it's really tough. But um, she, um, she was very happy with it. And um, Hector's mother, um, she just, you know, she, I, one of the things that really got me when I started speaking with her and speaking with Antoinette about the story was that um, at the time the incident happened, uh, journalists came to her home and asked her for photographs of Hector because his photograph was in the newspaper and there was some focus on him. And journalists came and in the, this is 1976, so she had a few what she called snapshots. Um, she handed them over to all these journalists for different magazines and newspapers, and she never saw them again. They were lost. So she doesn't have any photographs of her son, um, which just broke my heart. So I couldn't use, I mean, apart from the photograph, Sam's photograph of him um, dead, um, there was no reference of him, no pictures that I could look at. So I had to kind of make him up best as I could from, from Sam and Zima's images. And then also looking at Antoinette's um, relatives, uh, I kind of put together a, a face that I thought would represent Hector best. So I think, um, I think his mother is happy in her quiet way with it. <laughs> we have uh, one or two other questions that just came in the chat for Adrian, and then we're going to go to Elizabeth. Uh, are any one of those illustrated books in Spanish for you both? And uh, Adrian, about uh, your 100 time photos that you could use in a lesson with Hector. So why don't you answer that, and then we'll go to ask if your books are in Spanish. Sure. So um, the book is not published anywhere else other than the States. Um, I, I've been trying to find out. Um, my publisher is trying to see if it can be published in South Africa. Um, so far, no. I mean, times are really bad there, especially with COVID. The publishing industry is really, 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 um, really tough there. Um, and so far, no offers for anywhere else in the world and any other um, translation. So no. Um, and about the Time 100 photographs. Um, so Time Magazine, while I was working on the illustrations, I discovered this um, Time Time 100, it's called. There's a link on my website. Um, and I think also in the program for this conference um, to Time Time's 100 most influential images of all time. And uh, Sam and Zima's photograph is in that. And if you click on the photograph, there's a drop down to an explanation of what the photograph is. And then also a video that they put together. It's very well done. It's Time Magazine. So it's, it's impeccably done. And they interviews with Antoinette, Hector's sister. Um, the boy, we didn't talk about the boy who is carrying Hector. He was an unknown older boy who just happened by uh, the scene. He wasn't one of the students because he'd actually finished school. His name is Mboisa Makubu. And um, there's a whole separate story about him. But um, his sister is interviewed in this uh, video. Um, and there are a lot of really interesting pieces of footage um, of what happened that day. It's about a 12 minute video. So I encourage people to watch that if they're interested in finding out more. Okay, thank you. And Elizabeth. Uh, we do have someone in the chat asking about for your email address and presentations at school. It's been shared in the chat. If you'd like to say anything else about school presentations, uh, I have an additional question, but I'll give you a chance to speak to that if there's anything you'd like to share. Um, yeah, I love doing school presentations. Obviously, um, we haven't done any in-person anything in months. 
and I really miss being face to face um, with with young students. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I do a lot of I've been doing a lot of virtual school visits um, during the lockdown. So yes, you can um, email me at info at and um, I can share information there. And then someone asked um, the question that was about if any of the books are available in Spanish. Um, my book, Grandpa Cacao, is not available in any other languages at this time, but I believe The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind is available in Spanish. Um, and I think it is called El Niño Que Domo El Viento, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Um, at this time, I think that's the only book that's available in French, in, in Spanish, that I've illustrated. Yes, we've had an additional question come in. Uh, did you write and draw as a child? Oh yes, I was always the kid writing. Oh, well, not as, not so much writing, but drawing. I did did a lot of drawing as a child. Um, in fourth or fifth grade, I would draw um, horse drawings and sell them at recess. Um, I was in in high school. I was always staying after school and finishing my art projects. So I was always that artsy kid um, in class. Yeah, and I never changed. <laughs> Um, until other questions uh, come in, uh, I was really inspired by the fact that your book is centered around the grandfather that you never met. You didn't even, never even seen a picture of him. What inspired you to, to do this work about someone uh, that you've never met, even though that well, person was your grandfather? Yeah. Um, well, the older that my father gets, the more stories he has shared with me about his childhood and his parents. Um, both of my father's parents died when he was very young and he kind of moved away from the village where he was born. So he became kind of a very cosmopolitan educated person and didn't often talk about his life before that. And um, he, he's a great storyteller. He loves to tell stories and he's given me a lot of different nuggets um, when I was a student about his father and what he was like and how tall he was, um, what his facial features looked like and, and the kind of the, the roles that he had in the village um, when he was still alive. So I wanted to honor um, my grandfather because my American grandparents, my mother's parents were a huge fixture in my life as a child. Um, I saw them every summer. Um, I was living in the United States uh, near them when they passed away. So they were, they were real, really large influences in my life. So I wanted to honor, you know, the grandparents that I didn't know so much. And growing up in the, in the Ivory Coast, we lived in Abidjan, which is a big cosmopolitan city. We had, you know, we had a car, we had paved roads. We lived in a high rise apartment and I never visited my father's village. I never had any interest in going to a cacao farm, even though my father had a cacao farm near the village. And it's not until I was a student in the United States eating chocolate croissants during my, my break time in between classes that I started thinking, what if the chocolate that I'm eating in this chocolate croissant comes from my grandfather's farm? There's, nowhere, there's no way to know where the chocolate that I'm eating comes from. Um, so that's when I started investigating um, the process of cacao growing and harvesting and, and chocolate making and so kind of uh, the idea came from a lot a lot of different a lot of different places but mostly my father telling his stories thank you and adrian for you the same question did you draw and write as a child any childhood inspirations yeah like elizabeth not so much writing but uh drawing and painting always yes um i still have some nursery school paintings that my mother kept but yeah i i did it throughout and um um i tried everything i did art at high school and then i went on to art college um, where i did graphic design and illustration and uh, and then i went into work in advertising as an art director and graphic designer and even while I was doing that I did some work for myself um, at home but I also did I was the kind of fallback illustrator in the ad agency um, I would do renderings for um, this is all before internet and 
doing Google searches for images. I would do the magic marker layouts to present to um, commercials and advertisements to clients. And then if something uh, was needed to be, if something, if an illustration was needed and if the client couldn't afford the illustrator, then I would have to kind of take on someone else's style and illustrate in that style. And then I could never really use it because it was someone else's style, but I was, yeah, I was the in-house illustrator a lot. And there is a request for you, Adrian, as well, mm -hmm. to please share your email and your website. A question has come in for Elizabeth. Can you talk about your experience as a child coming from the Ivory Coast to the US and how other students uh, reacted to you or understood your experience? Oh, great question. So I came, I was born in the U.S., grew up in the Ivory Coast, came back right before I turned 13. Um, but when I was 11 or 12, we came back to the United States for about a year. So I was able to make some friends here in the United States in, in sixth grade. And then when I came back at the beginning of eighth grade, I had kept in touch with those American friends. And so it wasn't too much of a culture shock um, when I came back for good. But when I came in sixth grade, um, there were a lot of weird questions. Like, I mean, sixth graders are probably the worst. <laughs> Maybe not. I got a lot of questions like, oh, you're from Africa. You must have like a pet monkey. Or when you look out your window, you must see lions and zebras and giraffes. And I'll be like, no, like, where are you getting this? I, I had no idea what Americans thought Africa was like, but I quickly learned that, you know, <clears throat> kids, especially young kids, really didn't know anything about the continent of Africa or the fact that Africa is made up of 55 countries. And there are tons of languages and, and cultures and, and um, diversity, there's so much diversity, even within one country, one small country in Africa. I felt like I kind of became like the poster girl for Africa and people came to me to kind of educate them about the entire continent, which I thought, well, I, I haven't lived in the entire continent. I lived in one place for, you know, 12 years. Um, so that's why, that's part of the reason where, why as an illustrator, I'm really interested in promoting positive stories about Africa, diverse stories about people on the African continent and showing that it's not just war and poverty and famine and wild animals roaming around. There's, there's a lot happening everywhere, every day. It's a great thank question. You. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one other quick question and then we'll go to uh, Adrian. Uh, what do you uh, like about using oil as a medium versus other mediums? Um, I love oil paint because I can take my time with it. Um, in high school, I painted a lot with acrylic paint and I loved it. It was fast drying. Um, I got very comfortable painting with acrylic paint. And then when I got to art school, I decided you know, I really want to learn oil painting. I, I studied a lot of the Italian masters, European Flemish <clears throat> masters. Um, and I thought, I want to, I, I want to feel what it's like to paint like they, like they used to paint. I love oil paint. I can take my time. Um, I love process, step-oriented processes. So I love the idea of first painting a base coat of the paint and then waiting a couple of days for it to dry and then coming back in with um, a, a lighter color, maybe using a dry brush and, and blending my colors with different techniques, dry brush technique or with um, some linseed oil or with some mineral spirits. So I feel like working with oil paint offers me a lot of different ways to apply my paint and a lot of different um, effects that I can achieve with my paint that I'm not so sure I could really achieve with acrylic paint or gouache, for example. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with gouache. And I, I just like how, how oil paint feels on the paintbrush, hitting the paper. I'm a very tactile person. I like the sound of, of that paint hitting the paper. I like the process of mixing the linseed oil within the oil paint, using my palette knife, 
trying to achieve the, you know, the, the color that I'm trying to achieve. So it's a very tactile process oriented uh, preference, I guess, for me is, is using an oil paint. Adrian, to you. I think we all have heard about um, South Africa to some degree and apartheid. We have a question. What was it like growing up in South Africa as a white child with this kind of history? Yeah, so I, I grew up at the time that this event that I describe in the book happened. So I'm roughly Antoinette's age, so that dates me. <laughs> um, so I grew up, obviously, apartheid meant separate suburbs, um, separate schools, and the kids I was friends with were all white. And um, the only uh, black people we'd see would be people who were servants or um, in working in stores, you know, in the kind of um, more menial jobs in stores. Um, and, you know, black children had their own, they lived in their own world and we lived in our own world. Um, but I was very fortunate that uh, my parents were liberal and um, through the church that my parents belonged to, uh, especially when I was much younger, um, they made friends with a lot of um, Indian and Black families. Um, Indians had their own kind of township and Black people had their own township. Um, and through the church, though we had a white church, um, sometimes my parents and some of my parents' friends would um, reach out and include some of the people from the um, township ch churches and my mom made friends with a couple of teachers, a teacher and a school principal actually. And they used to come to our house and have dinner and there was another family with four kids and they used to come to our house and we were lucky enough to have a swimming pool and they swam in our pool. And you know, our neighbors would peer over the wall and like, what's going on? There are black people in their pool and horror upon horror, you know, this is, this is, how, this is how I grew up. Um, and at school, um, most of the most of the teachers and other students were, uh, you know, supported apartheid. Um, it was it took a long time before there were members members of parliament who who, who were um, kind of left leaning, I suppose you would call it. Um, it began to uh, gain traction and had more and more representatives in parliament to. Um, to try to bring along more, uh, more, more democratic kind of laws. Um, so I, I, that's how I grew up. Um, but I would, I'm very lucky that I had parents who taught us right from wrong. And actually the, the day that the Soweto school protest happened, we didn't, there was no TV in South Africa at that time. It hadn't, hadn't come to South Africa yet. So, all of the news was on the radio um, and my parents um, told us that evening, my mom told us what she'd heard on the radio, what was happening in Soweto. And she said, you know, there've been incidents before, but this time it's different. I just know it is. She told us that and she was right. Um, so um, I probably didn't have the typical white South African upbringing, but um, I was very lucky to have the one that I did. I've been given a signal that we have one minute. I thought we had a little bit longer there, uh, but um, is there anything, parting words that you'd like to? Um, I was just looking to see if there are another question. Anything you'd like to say that you haven't said? Um, we've got a lot of thanks and a lot of appreciation coming in on the chat. Any last words or? Eat chocolate. Yeah, eat chocolate. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to start uh, taking on my oil paints again. And you're making me want to paint with oil. So. Yes, and I have to take out my pastels. I have not used pastels in a long time. Okay, okay. Yeah. we'll check in with each other. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's been such a joy to do this. Thanks for attending. Yeah, thank, thank you to you the audience. audience. Thank you to our esteemed speakers and authors. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.